Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Park Attack campaign, and let's get right into it. Today I want to play Coaster Canyon, oh, let me click on that. Today I want to play Coaster Canyon, which is a barren desert canyon with ample land available for construction, and it provides a perfect spot for a new tourist attraction. A giant cliffside hypercoaster is the first step for this soon-to-be rollercoaster paradise, and the objectives are to get six coasters in the park with an excitement rating of 50 or above, which, in terms of excitement rating, that's not too difficult actually. And we also need to get 550 guests in the park, so I, th I, I kind of feel like I might reach that guest goal before I meet the coaster goal, but we'll see what happens. And then we also have the optional goal of having 700 guests in the park, which, uh, like I said, I might actually reach that optional goal. But I'm probably not going to reach the, uh, the optional goal of reaching all of the other objectives before the end of August year 2, because, you know, that's just me. Anyway, let's get into the scenario. This is one of the scenarios that I made, so I kind of know this this map like the back of my hand, but I didn't really play this scenario myself, so uh, I'm not actually that experienced when it comes to it. Now, there's two rides. We've got the giant hypercoaster, Cascade, and a simple orbiter here, and we're going to have to start with jacking up some of the prices on these things. I think you could easily make this 550, maybe even 6, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm gonna start off with this first. And uh, Cascade can easily be 12. I'm quite sure that people are going to be willing to pay that. Actually, I have to say that the stats on this are a bit disappointing for such a huge coaster. I guess it just doesn't have any noteworthy forces. But yeah, the most interesting thing about this map is just this giant cliffside, which can provide a lot of cool interaction with roller coasters, which this is kind of an example of, but you can probably wiggle in some different coasters in there as well. Um, and then we have some land on the other side of this river, but most of the land in the scenario is this giant flat space in the middle. So you do get a lot of space here. Now, I have to say, I want to build a sort of Wild West steampunk kind of park, but before I start building, I need to give a shout out to Astrotron, who makes amazing Parktech videos, and he posts a lot of really cool content on the Parktech Discord, uh, but also on Facebook and Reddit, and he came up with uh, the, the, the steampunk Wild West theme for this map before me. I wish I could take credit for that, but um, I guess we, we thought alike on this map. Anyway, uh, his stuff is really great, and it's always been an inspiration to me, honestly, so I just wanted to shout him out on this episode. But with that said, let's get into building stuff. So the first thing that I wanted to build here is a food court, because, well, the park doesn't really have any food options so far, and the depot is very conveniently right next to the park entrance, so I don't need to make any other external depots. I can just use this place to supply the stores. I might actually have to open another food court somewhere else in the park, just because this park is quite large, but for now, I'm sticking to this one. Now this building was generally inspired by, and I want to say inspired by very carefully because it doesn't look like it at all, uh, but it was generally inspired by the Armour Steiner house, which is an octagon house that is absolutely one of my favorite buildings in the world probably. It's one of the most steampunk looking buildings ever. I think it looks more steampunk than a million cogs and pipes and gears combined. It's this really old Victorian house in an octagon shape that is basically just one large dome uh, looking kind of like a traditional Roman domed temple. And it just has all of these really amazing Victorian details and this really slightly spooky looking steampunk aesthetic to it, although that's something that's more in hindsight because steampunk as a genre really just developed around this kind of architecture. Um, but yeah, it's an absolutely amazing building. Unfortunately, it's a bit difficult to make octagon shaped, uh, shaped buildings in Parkitect, and also it's quite difficult to make a decent looking dome. So I decided to go with completely different shapes, but the overall idea of a completely round, almost symmetrical, but not quite uh, looking building, and even some of the colors are based on the Armour Steiner house. So that's for the little food court there. Um, just found it a bit interesting to also share some of my interests here. And with that said, I want to move into the new coaster because I'm going to need to open five more coasters if I want to finish this scenario. So 
basically I was building that building um, just to let more time pass and research more coasters in hopes of getting a good coaster type and that paid off in the end because I got the Eurofighter or as it's called in game the vertical drop coaster which is probably one of my favorite coaster types just because it's so versatile so I was really happy to get that and I thought it might be interesting to have a vertical lift hill run up to the cliffside and then do a very small turnaround above that and um, after one break run just crash into the valley and do a couple of big elements there. So that's basically what I'm doing here. And I'm um, again using that little trick of trying to make a slightly more steep inversion than you could normally do without the autocomplete function. So there's a little bit of hard lining to that dive loop, which I think always looks quite neat, but it is always a bit of a try on error process to try and get it right and to try and get the auto complete to actually connect the pieces. But when you get it, I think it's really just satisfying how smooth it becomes. After that, it just does a large zero G roll and a, a sidewinder inside the cave. And after that it comes out and I was messing for a while with how I wanted the second part of the ride to go because I wasn't really sure. I uh, eventually ended up going for a mid-course break run here for capacity's sake as well because this is a Eurofighter in the end and these trains are really small so I'm gonna need as many break runs as I can fit into this coaster. Um, and yeah after that a small well sort of dive element very similar to Lost Gravity in Walibi which you get a lot of great hang time in, which I think is fairly typical for a Gerslauer coaster, so I thought that would probably fit into the coaster as well. After which we have a large corkscrew and then a helix element, which I'm still trying to mess with here. In the end, I think this coaster is a bit ridiculous and a little bit over the top. You would probably not see a coaster like this in real life, but I tried to base it as much as I could on the way that Gerslauer coasters tend to be built in real life. So it features very many of uh, the similar kind of elements as they do in real life. And um, just generally, I think the layout would be almost believable if it weren't for the fact that it's crashing down from a cliff and it has a sidewinder inside a cave, which is a bit over the top. Now for this station, um, I'm trying to build some western steampunk-ish buildings, but it's not going to be too over-the-top steampunk. I'm not going to have uh, pipes and things like that go everywhere, partly because I just don't have pipes in the scenery pack in this scenario. So um, I can't rely on all of those steam uh, details that Parkitect has to carry the steampunk theme. So I'm really just basing this on textures and shapes and the overall look of buildings. And for that I figured those uh, those steam roofs, which are the green ones that you can see here, uh, would work very well as the main cover of the station. And then to give it some slightly more interesting shapes and not make the station essentially a box, I'm adding a, a larger overhanging roof right in front of that. And that is basically the, the basic shape of this station. It's very simple, uh, but it also kind of divides it up into two compartments because a lot of this coaster is based around having a, a, an as good capacity as possible and it's for that reason that I have a separate unloading station and a loading station which I am so glad that this works in Parkitect because it's something that you know you kind of want to have realistically because a lot of real life coasters do this but it also helps out a great deal with capacity so at the end of the day you can see that this thing has many cars going through it and pretty much uh, a car entering and leaving the station at all times. In total I'm running five cars on this and they never have to wait on a block break except for the last one they have to wait for it a little bit. So I'm super happy with that actually. This is probably one of my most um, yeah, efficient coasters in terms of capacity. It might not have the best capacity but it will be difficult to draw much more capacity out of a large Eurofighter like this. So I'm really happy with that. Uh, and with the fact that oh, you can just see trains go up the lift hill time and time again, uh, which is really cool. And then I'm adding some buildings here um, just to hide the staff room, basically, because as soon as I plopped down employees, I saw that they were becoming very tired very quickly because there was a lot to do for some reason. This park started off with all of the lamps broken. So I had to get mechanics to go around and fix all of that stuff and then I quickly had to place down a staff room 
for them to rest after they did all of that work. So I'm just building these western style buildings here uh, just to hide all of that, but I'm adding some slight steampunky details to it, I would say, like the um, the spire decorations on the blue building and then the, the metal steam spire on the other building. It's not over the top, I think, and it's very subtle, but it's not the most typical western style building. I'm trying to make everything at least a tiny bit more gritty and industrial looking than the theme would typically be. And finally, uh, I wanted to place a flat ride here just to fill up this space and I didn't have a choice but build an enterprise because that's all that we have at the moment. But I think that also fits the slightly steampunk theme and um, it makes for an interesting interaction also between the enterprise and the coaster because the enterprise goes almost vertical uh, and it comes very close to the coaster when it does that actually, so uh, it's not too often that you see an interesting kind of interaction between a coaster and a flat ride, because flat rides are pretty static most of the times and don't really come off their place very much, but uh, I think with an enterprise you can actually do some really interesting things. I love these things also, I could definitely ride these time and time again until uh, at some point after a few rides my stomach does get very grumbly though but enterprises are honestly a really cool kind of relaxing ride i think and probably as in terms of going upside down it definitely features quite a bunch of loops anyway uh moving on i'm adding two new coasters on this side i figured it would make sense to build a dueling coaster because that uh, adds quite a bit of coasters to the coaster count um, and I was waiting basically for research this whole time because I was getting a lot of coaster types that I wasn't really a big fan of. I actually tried building a suspended coaster between this, but that never really turned into much good, so decided to bin that idea. And um, after that I got the Hyper Coaster, which is an absolutely beautiful coaster type, so I figured I could go for uh, some kind of dueling Hyper Coaster here. Uh, now I have to say, Strictly speaking, depending on if you want to have the loose or strict definition of a hyper coaster, these coasters aren't hyper coasters because they're not tall enough. Um, but I guess this would be like a, a B&M mega coaster if they were actually using that term. Uh, there's one in China that uh, was opened about a year ago, which I totally forgot the name about. It had something to do with music. But anyway, that looked really cool and that had some really... Uh, funky elements and kind of different from most B&M hyper coasters as well. It didn't just focus on straight airtime, but it had a lot of curves and banked hills in the middle of the layout as well, which I thought was really interesting. And I figured a layout like that could work very well, especially if I'm trying to build dueling hyper coasters, which, you know, admittedly is something that doesn't exist, and I'm not sure how well it would work in the real world. Um, but I think here it's a it's a pretty interesting mix of coasters and I'm trying to make these tangle as much as I can and I'm trying to make these things interact and kind of cross each other's paths as much as I can because that's just about the only really exciting thing you can do with dueling hyper coasters. You can't have interlocking loops or loops that meet each other like Dragon Challenge did uh, with coasters that do go upside down. And the first half was actually pretty quickly built. I didn't even need to test this first half, like the coasters were pretty much automatically just uh, perfectly in sync. So I was super happy with that. And then my second idea was to do this kind of um, diamond height style where they go apart in the second half of the layout and just do their own little airtime hills. So that's what I started out with. And um, I can already say that eventually I didn't go with this layout option because it just didn't do all enough um, because part of a dueling coaster is just that the, the, you want the trains to be close to each other or at least to have certain moments where they meet up and where they cross their, each other's paths. So the two tracks being apart like this was kind of defeating the purpose of a dueling coaster. Um, but also I had extreme difficulties trying to get this second track to go back to the station without intercepting the other track. And uh, it was even more difficult to get these to actually be in sync when I was doing it like this. So eventually I had to bin this idea. Um, I'm also just not a fan of how it looks in general. I really prefer the kind of very interactive type of layout. 
Um, and then there's the fact that uh, I realistically probably had to make use of the river valley because at this point the coasters had lost a lot of speed. So if I want one of the coasters to remain on the high ground on the other side of the station, it's not going to be that fast anymore. So it would probably be better to have it go through the river valley. Uh, make sure that I use as much of that potential energy that you get from the lift hill as possible. And then once they return to the station, they've pretty much used up all of their energy, which is the perfect case scenario for a coaster. So yeah, that's how I decided to change the layout in the end. Um, it also made for some slightly more, uh, slightly more interesting interaction between the two layouts, I think, since you've got one of the coasters just doing a simple airtime hill routine and then the other coaster doing S-bends right next to it, so you get some more interesting interaction there. Although I also have to say, that probably makes one of the coasters way less fun than the other one, because uh, one of them has two straight great airtime hills in a row, and the other one just does a bunch of S-bends in that place, but hey. Maybe not everybody is like a coaster enthusiast, and maybe some people really prefer S-bends over airtime hills. I know I wouldn't, but at least I was trying to compensate with uh, the airtime hill going over the other coaster that you do on the coaster that does these S-bends. Anyway, again, I was getting into a bit of a predicament when it comes to the brake run because it was quite difficult to get uh, this second coaster to go over the other one to enter the brake run in a decent looking way. And one of the weirdest things is that Something that I noticed is that one of the coasters had lost a lot of energy during the layout and the other one hadn't. Uh, so basically the, the coaster that goes over the other one in this final curve here was going faster by the end of the layout than the other one. And it was only slightly so, but because of that it was losing the race. Uh, or no, it was winning the race every time. No matter how much I tried to change the layout, and no matter how much uh, track length I tried to add to it at the end here, uh, it would always win. And I found this really weird, um, or at least it was understandable. I, I figured it wouldn't have lost as much energy because it does these airtime hills instead of S-bends. Um, so yeah, there are more parts where the layout is slower, the track is shorter but slower in general, so I think that makes sense. But then the strangest thing is that when I closed this, this park file and reopened it later, for some reason the coasters were way out of sync and the coaster that used to be faster was suddenly a lot slower, uh, uh, well relatively, and they had about the same speed as they moved into the final brake run. So I don't know what's up with that, I have no idea why for some reason the coaster would become slower upon closing the park file and reopening it. But whatever happened, uh, I just reopened the park file here and you can see me changing all of the colors and then basically you can see the testing happening in the background. At this point I had already changed the layout so you can see that uh, the curve is shorter on the top coaster again and they are now perfectly in sync when they enter the station. No idea why that whole thing happened though and why I had to fix it in the end. I just find it strange that the speed of the coasters would change, even if it's just slightly, upon uh, reopening the park file. But in the end, I think it's kind of a good thing, as weird as it is, because it forced me to go back and change the layout a little bit. And this time I was able to get the coasters so much in sync, that uh, sometimes one of the coasters wins, and sometimes the other one wins. And honestly, that's something that I've never been able to reach in Park Attack. Whenever I've made dueling coasters, there would always be one train that always wins, even if it's just by a slight margin, but these guys are now entering the station at pretty much exactly the same time, which is absolutely awesome, and I really don't know how it happened, but I'm actually kind of glad for it now, because it means that this is a proper dueling coaster, as you'd want to have one in real life, so I'm really happy with it. This is probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite coasters that I've made in the game so far. So yeah, not gonna complain about it, I just found it really strange how the speed had changed upon reloading the save file, but it just kind of fixed the coaster in the end. Now I'm building the station here, which was loosely inspired by these old Victorian train stations with the large ironwork uh, roofs. Although, 
I had to go for these very pointy uh, curved roofs here because those are just the curved roofs that we have in Parktect. And just because I'm a spire man, I decided to build a spire on top of it as well. And this is quite a large and chunky spire, making up a 2x2 two two grid space, which is really big, but in the end, the station is very big in general, so I don't, I don't feel like it's really too big for this station building. And it also means that I can add a whole lot of details to these things, that's basically what I'm doing here. There are clocks at some parts, uh, there's a lot of different wooden posts and decorations, and finally some dormers with windows all the way at the top, and then just one, one final roof spire uh, above that. So it's a very complicated spire structure, uh, but I think it works quite well and all the pieces come together pretty coherently. And that is basically the main draw and maybe even the main weenie for this whole area of the park and the thing that will hopefully uh, make people cross that wooden bridge into these, uh, the area with these coasters to ride these things. I should have probably opened the coasters at this point, but I was too busy building to remember that I should probably open these. Uh, but still, as you can see, every time they come into the station, uh, you really can't even tell which of the trains is winning and which of the trains is losing, which I'm just so happy about. Uh, and then when it comes to the final brake run here, I decided to put a roof over this as well and add some extra supports just to make the station a bit bigger, make it fit uh, a bit better into the scale of that giant spire. And then for the queue lines, I'm adding these two identical little buildings to have uh, some kind of cover over this switch track section. But aside from that, the queue lines are not going to be too uh, intricately themed or anything. And I think this is, again, also kind of where the steampunk uh, feeling of the park comes in. I'm not really adding any gears or uh, other steam elements to this, although I have to say, I did research the scenery in the meantime, and I did get the gears and all of those moving steampunk bits, which is really cool, but in the end I decided not to use them and just keep everything more subtle. But I think the giant iron uh, roof of the station, the intricate spire, and the brass looking roofs over the queue, at least signify some of that steampunk aesthetic that I was going for. Plus some of the uh, some of the lamps and other path elements and decorations that I'm using are from the Steamworks set in Parkitect. But yeah, I find it really cool that Parkitect actually does have scenery that's specifically geared to steampunk, so maybe I'll go and fully envelop myself into a steampunk theme in some scenario in the future, but I can't give any spoilers about that one. But um, yeah, it'll probably happen, but for now, I'm sticking mostly to different themes here. And uh, finally, I wanted to build some kind of flat ride somewhere before I uh, went back into a real-time section and just show you these coasters. But it was really difficult to fit anything into that other space because there's a lot of coasters there, so in the end I decided to just put a simple carousel right next to the entry of this bridge here. And that's basically that. It's not going to be too flashy. I'm once again just trying to come up with a slightly different roof structure from the roofs that I've put on carousels so far. Um, but this thing is really not too special. I'd really say it's kind of a filler uh, addition into the park. I did decide to add some glass on top of the roof, which realistically doesn't really make sense. But this being an isometric game, I thought it would be a nice way to make clear that somewhere underneath that roof is actually a carousel. So yeah, this is something that really only works if you're looking at the park from above, but I thought it would be a nice addition to it. And yeah, that is basically it for this whole area. I'm just adding some final small details around the paths here and adding some small foliage elements. Finally, also a catwalk for the break run of the Eurofighter. But that's about it uh, for this time lapse. So let's go into a quick real time section and see what the park looks like. All right, so let's take a look at what we have here. Here's the food courts and these two other buildings hiding the staff room. And finally, the yet unnamed Eurofighter. So I'm just gonna give this a quick POV. I think you can call this a POV, even though it's not entirely on ride. Uh, so yeah, we dropped down into this little dip here, which I thought would be a fun way to start the ride. Kind of a bit of a teaser, 
And then here's the brakes that also function as block brakes. So that's one extra train on the circuit. Uh, into this large drop, a very smooth dive loop, I think, here. And into a smooth, very gradual zero-g roll over the paths. And then inside, there's a sidewinder, which is a bit strange, but it's uh, the best way to turn around there. Uh, into another brake section, just as the other car comes off the lift hill. So the timing on that is quite tight, actually. Uh, and then into this corkscrew, finally a helix. And once we're out of that, it's into another block brake section. And it doesn't even need to be stopped here. Oh, right, it's the first block brakes that it's stopped at. So yeah, this is the whole reason how the, the track is actually so efficient. You always have one car waiting on these block brakes waiting for the next car to clear the lift hill uh, and as soon as it does that uh, it, it will well go on this and it pretty much matches the timing of the rest of the ride so i think the thing that's most important here is that the lift hill is long enough uh, to have a longer duration than any other block on the entire ride but yeah in the end i think it works out quite well and it makes for a pretty efficient coaster uh, Ooh, and i want to quickly give these things a pov let me just get on this train. Uh, so these things are also have no name yet, but here you can probably see how they work and what they look like. Uh, we're currently on the purple one, so yeah, I think that works out. I'm actually going to move the camera a bit so we get a better view of the airtime hills, but as you can see they meet up exactly over here with the way that the S-bands work, then they go underneath the other train, and finally, I think this one might win... I'm not entirely sure. I'm actually going to have to hide scenery here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very hard to tell. I really can't tell which train won on that occasion. Uh, so let's do a quick POV of the green one here. Um, but yeah, I love the interaction that these two coasters have with each other. I feel like I kind of accidentally built a really good layout on these things. Unfortunately, the guests aren't really filling it up completely yet. But still, I'm pretty sure that these make plenty of money already. So you can see that every element is slightly different. And here on those curves, you've got some really cool interaction. Here they go uh, and cross paths again at the same time. Um, ooh, green is far ahead over here, but here they cross again. And I think green is going to win this one. Uh, looks like green is ahead, yeah. On that airtime hill especially, you can tell. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure. Actually, no, Green lost that one. Yeah, that was clearly lost by Green. Anyway, you, you can see here how the interaction between these dueling coasters works very well. And sometimes there's a clear winner, uh, and sometimes there really isn't. And this is also the first time that I'm noticing that uh, guests really seem to have quite an effect on how coasters run. Unfortunately, both of these trains are pretty empty, so you can't really notice a very stark difference. But at some point, I had one almost completely full train and an almost empty train. And the full train won by a mile on that one. So I think you can really tell a difference here. Let's see if we can actually have a train that is more different than these so far. Mm, doesn't look that way. Uh, yeah, that looks like another win for purple, actually, even if it's just very slight. And this is also quite... Now this is also interesting and kind of realistic. Sometimes they slightly mess up the dispatch time, so one train will leave slightly earlier than the other one. I think we can see at the bottom of the drop here, yeah. You can see the first drop is entirely uh, identical for both coasters, uh, but green is ever so slightly ahead of purple here. So it's really cool how they have these minute differences. Now from looking at the coasters go around a few times, um, I'm very certain that purple actually wins most of the times, even if it's by a slight margin. Um, but I've seen some rides where green is more full than purple is, uh, and in that case green wins. So yeah, it's not a perfectly dueling coaster, but then again, that's extremely difficult to even get close to. But it's about as close as I think you can realistically get in Park Tech. Like on that one, I could hardly make out a, a winner. It seemed like purple was slightly first, but something to keep in mind is that uh, green enters the brake run with more speed than purple does, because purple is coming from above here and green is coming up. Um, so they're always even out once they're halfway through the, the brake run, so it's really hard to tell exactly who wins in that scenario and where I guess the finishing line would be. 
Anyway, that's it for this quick overview of what the park looks like so far. I'm gonna add two more coasters because that's what I need. Uh, I'm almost at 500 people, so can't be too worried about that. And my income, as you can see, is absolutely astronomical. Partly because this Eurofighter is just such an amazing moneymaker. It makes a very steady, uh, well, 1,500 euros, I'd say. Dollars? What are we using again? Uh, we're using dollars here. And these two coasters are probably making a decent amount of money as well, yeah. You can see that they've only recently opened, but they're already making decent money. Especially if you compare it to the fact that they are barely running full capacity so far and many of the seats are still empty. So I think theoretically these two could make a whole lot more even. Yeah, max revenue is more than $3,000 per month for these two coasters uh, separately alone. So that's quite a lot of money. Anyway, let's get building again. Alright, and it is at this point that I finished this time lapse and looking at the amount of time that this video is going to take, I'm a little bit astonished and afraid because this is going to be probably my longest video in this series so far. I'm sorry if this thing just keeps going, I'm just documenting everything that I'm doing in this scenario so it might get boring at some parts, but um, you can always feel free to skip ahead to the final section where I show off the park. Anyway, I'm here to explain what I'm doing and why and all of that. So um, I'm starting off here with a spinning coaster and I realized that I only use the Gerstlauer spinning cars so far in the spinning coaster that I've built. And the game also has mech spinning coaster cars for the same track, which is really cool. And I just keep forgetting that some coasters in Park Tech have options for different kinds of trains. So I'm gonna try to remember that and actually make use of it more often in the future. Uh, but here I thought it would be interesting because these kinds of spinning coasters have, well, very different layouts from Gerslauer spinning coasters or any spinning coaster anyway uh, that only uses separate cars. Because these have trains, which means that you don't need to put in as many block brake sections and you can go for much larger sweeping elements. So that's also what I'm doing here. I'm starting this layout off with uh, one of those horseshoe elements which are really fun. Um, this general layout is really just based on Dwerfelwind in Toverland which is the only max spinning coaster that I've personally been on but I think it's quite a, a good indication of what they are like in general. So after that first element it's just a bunch of helixes, some S-bends to get the car spinning and um, some hills in general, so it's just a very simple layout. I just tried to um, make it fit into this quite narrow space as much as I could, and also to make it a bit of a, an out and back narrow layout, because that's really the only thing that I had space for over here. Uh, and finally, of course, a long brake run, so that at least I can run two trains on this thing, uh, because if I don't, it's going to be a bit inefficient. Not that I'm too concerned about that, because if you look at <laughs> the amount of money that I have in the bottom left corner, you can see that I'm already waking, uh, making way too much, and this scenario is probably not going to be very difficult at this point anymore. I'm just trying to build things uh, in a way that looks nice, but as far as the monetary aspect and the simulation of the scenario goes, I'm pretty much done with this, with this park. I really just need to make sure that I get six coasters, and then we're all set. So for this coaster I'm keeping the scenery a little bit less over the top than the two dueling coasters because those things are really meant to be the main attractions for the park. Uh, really the flagship right there and even the weenie for this area so everything around it will be a little bit more subdued. This one in particular uh, just has a pretty standard looking station. I just decided to add a front uh, which is uh, more of a western saloon style building, but it's really only a facade because the rest of the building is much more generic. And then I've got a very generic uh, cover over the brake run as well, just with some little flourishes here and there, but there's really not too much to it. I decided to add one of these large round covers for the queue line of the teacups to make this look a little bit more steampunky, um, which I think works well enough, even though the design is clearly a rip-off from one of the covers that I've built earlier in this scenario, uh, the one for the uh, Enterprise. 
And with that all said, I wanted to add a cover to the teacups themselves because it's just a completely uncovered teacups ride. Looks a little bit strange. Um, and because I couldn't come up with any really interesting shape to put on here, I thought it might be interesting to do some artwork with the roof pieces. Take the diagonal pieces and give them some slightly different colors and mix them up a little bit to get a, a sort of a Jackson Pollock style roof to this ride. Um, okay, maybe, maybe it's not that artsy, it's really simple, but it's just a bunch of very random-ish uh, elements of colors. It's it's kind of the same idea as a Jackson Pollock painting, all right? If you transcribe that to Parkitect and uh, decide to make it a million times more simple, and and just to keep the the steampunk-ish aesthetic a little bit alive, I added a big tower to it, which doesn't serve any any real purpose, but it has a, a cool big chimney attached to it, so that's a little bit industrial-ish looking. And finally, I'm adding a toilet building here because the uh, nearest toilet is quite far away from this section of the park. And I decided that I might as well put a first aid room in there as well. Now, I'm not too sure how necessary these first aid rooms are, but I think, you know, they're, they're one of these things that you can use to prevent people from vomiting because they can go in there if they're sick, I believe, uh, and then get healed before they uh, drop all their stuff on the path. Which is, I guess, sort of an advantage to have, but I don't think they're the most necessary building. So it's typically something that I only place when I'm running out of uh, different purposes to give buildings. Uh, and speaking of buildings without a purpose, I also decided to add this big tank with uh, storage for whatever it is that would be stored in here to add a bit of industrial vibe to this area. And I said I wouldn't add pipes to anything, but I figured that for this I should at least add some pipes because realistically they should be there. Um, but because I don't have the actual steam pipe pieces uh, in, in this scenario, I already un unlocked all of the scenery that you can unlock in this scenario and steam pipes are not in there. So can't do much about that. But because we don't have those, I decided to just use the basic shapes for this, which honestly they work really well for pipes. You can't use the actual sphere elements to build the uh, the corners of the pipes, but with those half spheres, you can build some decent transitions and corners between pipes, and the pipes themselves are just, well, simple cylinder pieces. So there's a lot of stuff that you can actually do with those very basic shapes. Now moving on from that, I decided to work a little bit more on the main street. I know this isn't too much of a, an actual main street, but it's definitely the main street of this park, so this is where I want to build all of the western style wooden buildings with those fancy facades and um, these overlapping roofs going over the, the front of the path. So I'm just adding some slightly uh, varying designs alongside here, but there's really not too much that's really worth noting about these buildings. I just wanted to place these mostly to set the scene and make this whole park feel very uh, western. What I do think is interesting though is that this is the second time that I'm doing this kind of theme in this playthrough of the campaign. Uh, and the first time was in a park which I kind of forgot the name of right now, but anyway, I've done it before and I kind of went back to check and see what looked different about this second attempt. And overall, I feel like the colors are a lot more subdued in this park. There's some more detail to the buildings, uh, a lot more different elements, and the buildings are quite a bit different as well. In the older park, it was much more of a, a traditional kind of main street setup with all of the buildings really attached and really just the facades being different. And in this park, the buildings are more often detached, more details, just more different in general, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting how there's a, a change maybe even in the way that I'm playing the game uh, as we're going through this campaign because truth be told it's already been half a year and I'm only about what 17 episodes in so I'm not moving too fast with this I know and also it's been such a long time that you can probably even see my style slightly change throughout this as new pieces, uh, or well, at least I get used to new pieces in the game, um, or 
you know, in general, I just change up the way that I use colors or whatever. I, I do feel like there are some slight differences in the style that I'm building things. I should also say, I'm sorry about the low, the, the slow rate that these videos are coming out, uh, but also these videos take an enormous amount of time. For each five minutes of time lapse, there's about an hour of in-game footage, and then I need to record all of the commentary and things, fit it all together, edit it together, so there's quite a lot of work that goes into these things, which is why I can't bring out these episodes as often as I might want to. Uh, that said, this episode is a lot longer than I was hoping it to be, and than I'm hoping most episodes to be. And I know I keep saying that a lot of these episodes are much longer than I want them to be, but it, honestly, if they're all going to be this long, it's just going to take way too long to finish the game. So I'm gonna try to put some pep in my step and at least make some of the other scenarios more uh, small in scale. So I don't necessarily have to sacrifice on the detailing or scenery, but at least, you know, add less things in each park. Uh, but then for this one, there's not too much that I can do about it, because the entire goal of this scenario is to build six coasters, or well, to build five coasters, because you already start out with one, uh, with an excitement rating of at least 50, so that's already a lot of effort that goes into building different coasters and giving them awesome scenery, etc. So yeah, not too much that I can do about it in this scenario, but there will be some scenarios in the future which will be uh, much shorter than this. Hopefully somewhere in the 20-30 minutes, maybe a little bit more range, uh, should be more doable than a video of an hour uh, with many hours of gameplay in it. Anyway, uh, decided to finish up the main street with a few buildings on this side which are connected, but really they're just different variations of a similar theme. Anyway, it's time to move into something that's actually exciting to talk about, which is me building this B&M wing coaster with a launch. Um, which is going to be the sixth coaster in the scenario, and hopefully the one that'll make me finally finish the scenario. There were a lot of options for me to choose from at this point, because I kept research researching coasters throughout building the other ones. So at this point my coaster tab was looking very full and very complete. I could even uh, choose to build a monorail coaster, which is the one that you unlock in this scenario by getting 700 guests before you uh, get the six coasters in your park. But in the end, I opted to go for a B&M wing coaster with a launch, because that's something that I don't think I've tried before. Uh, these things are also really fun to build, and I think it's just the thing that fits best into the very limited space that I still have. Uh, between the, the, the dueling hyper coasters and the coaster that was already there. I could have chosen to actually expand the park, make it bigger and put this coaster somewhere else, but I just really wanted to fill up this empty space and just have the scenario where every single part of the map, is, at least the map that is unlocked, is completely built up by coasters, which I figured would look really cool. And yeah, this thing just fits right in by virtue of being a launched coaster, so you don't need to deal with all of that lift hill stuff, uh, which makes it a little bit more compact, and it's also a good excuse to go kind of out and back, because the real-life coaster that this coaster is based on, which is in Holiday World, uh, which I think it's Thunderhawk, but I'm not entirely sure if that's actually the name. Thunderbird? Something like that. Something about a bird and some natural element. Anyway, uh, the, the one that this is based on is also kind of out and back, and even though it's not very compact, I feel like you could build a very similar layout in a very small amount of space. So the overall design that I'm going for here is just a launch straight out of the station, uh, or well, at least not straight out of the station, at least a block break before it, so that I can actually run two trains on this thing. Uh, but after that, a launch uh, into a, a giant Immelman, and then a bunch of elements, um, that kind of twist in and out of each other before we go all the way to the back of the park and this is where stuff actually gets very difficult. So far it was kind of a smooth ride in terms of building this because I had a lot of space to work with um, but at the back here I need to find a way to make this thing return to the station in a way that doesn't uh, interfere too much with the two hyper coasters because I didn't want this coaster to go all over the hyper coasters but also there's, there's path on the other side of the valley, so there's really barely any space to work with here. Plus, I wanted to fit in a long brake run, so that I can probably uh, actually slow down this coaster before it enters the station, and have a realistic uh, final block brake section where I could stall the second train. 
So yeah, this was kind of difficult to get right. At the end, I decided to go with this thing where I'm building this, this curve that just kind of snakes left and right over the middle section, which keeps the middle section free to build anything in there. Um, and it makes sure that we have some cool interaction going between the track and the station. So in the end, this is the overall layout that I went with. I think the only downside to doing it like this is that the layout itself is not that interesting. The second half of the layout is kind of, you know, just finishing up the, the last remaining energy of the ride because there are no more twists or inversions at the end of the layout here, which is a bit of a bummer, but I think this layout just looks way better than anything else I had tried, so I'm keeping it like this. Now, as for building the station, it's always a little bit more of a challenge to build a station for a wing coaster because these things are really big, so you need a large section of land with no supports. So that means quite a large station. So I decided to go for, once again, kind of a, a very typical station building, um, but then just add some decorations around it that make it stand out a little bit more. So we've got that standard roof in the middle and then some flat sections on the side. And I'm adding a spire here because I love spires and because it breaks up the blocky look of the station otherwise a little bit. Makes it look a bit more interesting. And well, a spire is always a really fun experiment also because it just gives you time to look at all the different pieces in the game, how you can place them and how you can put them together to make a unique looking structure. Which uh, with spires you can pretty much stick anything uh, together and see if it works. Which usually results in some interesting combinations of objects. So in this case, for instance, I decided to add a very large flat section just underneath the, the spire itself, where there would be kind of a, a bell tower uh, section. And then on the sides of that, for the decorations, I used some of the steam elements. Um, just because the actual roof borders snap to the grid, so you can only place these on a full grid tile, so that's always a little bit annoying to work with. But the steam pillars, uh, the horizontal and vertical ones, are completely off the grid so you can place them in whatever way you want. So those things are a lot more flexible and they're usually quite useful for things like this. And then the top of the spire is actually kind of simple. Just a bunch of simple wall pieces and a big spire roof piece. And that's about it. I decided to add some foliage around the ride, but it's really just about the same kind of foliage that's already in the rest of the park as well. Just trying to fit this in a little bit. And then I guess the final ride actually of the park is going to be this wipeout here, which is not that special, I know, but I just wanted to have one more flat ride for a decent balance. So I figured the wipeout would probably work best. It was the only thing that comfortably fit into the space without removing the supports for the coasters. So that's what I ended up going for here. A lot of the layouts of this park uh, and even some of the layouts of the coasters are very consciously built in a way to try and avoid removing coaster supports. Uh, because one of the things that I still struggle with in Park Tech sometimes is the fact that coaster supports are removed by um, paths and things like that. But it's quite difficult because coaster supports are often in the middle of grid pieces. So they are on two grid pieces at the same time, which means that if you build anything on either of those pieces, uh, you might be deleting the entire support all at once. So really a lot of this park is carefully laid out to try and avoid removing coaster supports, which is also why you see the paths snaking in some strange ways every now and then. Um, it's the reason for some of the coaster elements being the way they are and even for some of the buildings being in the places that they are. Anyway, uh, one thing which I also think is interesting for this ride is the catwalks that I made for it. I don't think I've really tried catwalks for wing riders like this, uh, but I think it works out quite all right. So we just have one half roof piece sitting all the way at the end of uh, one of the tiles and then three grid tiles away from that another half roof piece so these catwalks are very wide but the coaster cars actually fit just in between them and the great thing about these catwalks is that they are completely on grid so you can at least put some borders and fences like that on the side which make them look quite a bit nicer than if you need to make catwalks out of pieces that don't snap to the grid which there are very few of 
Uh, and I decided to add, finally, another building to round up the main street here. The station of the wing coaster is pretty much the end of the main street proper. There won't be any typical western style town buildings anymore after that section. Although there is some more scenery, we do have the station for the hypercoaster that was already in the park and the wipeout. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty much the end of the western town there. Oh, and I totally forgot, I actually lied about the wipeout being the last ride of the park. Uh, this top spin was the last ride of the park because I looked back at this space and realized that there was quite a lot of empty space in the middle of the Eurofighter and I was already planning to put some kind of ride in here. I just couldn't fit any of the rides that I already had in here because at the time when I kept checking this space I only had giant flat rides like the turbine and the topple tower and none of them fit well into this space. But at last I got a top spin which fits quite neatly so I decided to build that in here. Uh, it's not the greatest top spin because it doesn't really show off what it's doing. Usually you do want to have some kind of stage right in front of it where people not riding the top spin can at least uh, watch people go around on it. Uh, so I'm kind of missing that here, but there wasn't too much that I could do with this space anyway because it's a very narrow plot of land between two coasters or well between two sections of coaster tracks. So this was just about all that I could do with it. And finally, I built this seating area here, where you can just sit down underneath a roof and, I don't know, eat or something. There's a bunch of stalls in the area, but I didn't really have uh, places where you can just rest, sit down and eat something, so I decided to, un to add that underneath that roof. And the very last thing in this episode is building a roof for the wipeout, which is always a bit annoying because these things are really tall, because when they start spinning and going up, it's really difficult to fit a roof inside of it or above it. Uh, I just reached the goals, as you can see, by all of the confetti. Uh, and yeah, that is pretty much it. I know I was kind of rambling uh, at the end here, but I was just kind of doing things all over the park to finish it up. But at the end of the day, this is absolutely a huge park. So let me show you around and see what it looks like. Alright, now I want to do this quick because this video is already getting long enough, but here's a final look into the new coasters in the park and just an overview of the park in general. Let's first take a look at the spinning coaster here. So yeah, there's not too much to say about this layout to be honest. It's just really simple, I'm just trying to emulate what these things are like in real life. Although I do have to say it's really difficult to get these to spin in park tech. Like you really need some quick curves and transitions to actually get these to spin very well. So yeah, it doesn't spin that well, but also... Ooh, actually, especially on that last helix, that's actually quite a decent spin. And I know at the end here, it spins quite a bit going into the brake run as well. Um, but yeah, maybe not the best layout from an on-ride perspective. But I think it looks quite decent and it fits into the park quite well. And then we've got the main street over here with all of these different buildings. Not too many of these actually have a use. Um, as far as I remember, yeah, we have a food court over here, um, which is pretty much just the depot plus two stalls, but that works all right. And a toilet over here, but that's really just about it. The rest of these are all kind of just decoration and here to create the idea of having uh, an actual food court. Now, I'm gonna follow the wing rider here. And as you might see, I made the block breaks in such a way that the waiting time in the station allows the train to wait before the launch, which I think in the case of a launched coaster is actually something that you want to do just to keep that suspense just before the launch. And I think it's a decent layout actually, I'm really happy with this. It's overall quite smooth and it's often really difficult to fit these layouts in right because uh, wing riders have such an enormous hitbox because the train is all the way on the side so you always need to have uh, three open grid spaces on both sides and if you want to do any inversions you have to be very careful about any track that's around it just because the cars will flip and rotate and their hitboxes are just enormous but yeah i really like this layout and I know I have a tendency to only show layouts from one perspective, but I think uh, this one, as well as many of the other ones in the park, uh, kind of work well from many different perspectives. This one I actually really like from this perspective. The way that it looks with these different curling inversions is really cool. Uh, although, like I kind of said, 
It's not the best layout to ride and you can probably kind of tell that I made this to look good from an isometric perspective. Um, I would have probably liked to make it a bit longer on this side if I had any space for that and fit in an inline twist somewhere as most wing riders will have at the end of their layout. Uh, could have even been over here but yeah given the space that we have in this scenario I wasn't really able to fit that in but overall I'm pretty happy with it. And I'm also really happy with a lot of the other coasters in the park. Though I have to say, my favorites are definitely these two hyper coasters. I'm super happy with how these turn out. And I guess I should probably point out some of the excitement ratings on these coasters as well. I, I thought it was interesting about this one that the purple has a higher excitement rating than green, I believe. Yeah, green only has 80 and purple is 86. Uh, which I think is largely due to the fact that purple just has more airtime, especially with these major airtime hills at the end here. Um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. We also have uh, uh, an excitement rating of just 53 on the spinning coaster. I actually had to put quite a bit of scenery around this to even make this go above 50. So at least scenery makes quite a difference. This was originally uh, a, a, 44, uh, a 48, yeah, I think, excitement rating. Uh, but then adding all of the scenery around it made it 53. So if you just can't make the excitement rating go on a scenario, fret not, you might still be able to get there with scenery as well. Uh, the wing coaster is quite decent with 81, and the Eurofighter, I actually don't know, 92? Jesus. That might honestly be the highest excitement rating of any coaster that I've worked on in any of the scenario maps. Huh, that's pretty cool. Although maybe the underground section has something to do with that, I'm not entirely sure. I wouldn't see what about this layout is so good, but sure, I'll take it. Um, so yeah, that's it. We've got the entrance area over here with the, the quirky uh, sort of steampunk looking building here. Uh, large main streets with all these very western town style buildings. And finally a wipeout and the orbiter that was already here. And if you look at the park from a distance, it's just a giant spaghetti of different roller coasters. I tried to give each one of them a slightly different color, um, but I also wanted everything to have kind of steampunk-ish colors. So we've got a dark industrial kind of red color here, purple and green, but in the kinds of shades that I think would work very well with the theme. Uh, this one's just brown, which is a bit boring, but I couldn't really find any other color that looked good with this track type. Uh, this one's orange, inspired by Holiday World's Thunderbird, but a slightly different shade of orange that's a bit more gritty. And I also recolored the first coaster that we had to um, some kind of dark blue-ish. It's hard to tell exactly what the color is like, and it's very close to black, but it's not entirely black. Anyway, that's just uh, all of the coasters. I'd like to thank you guys for watching this episode and I actually can't wait to see what the next park is going to be because once again I actually have no clue and I'm actually not sure what the trophy on this is going to be either. Okay, so it's just the little mining equipment that's on the side of the hill. Oh, that's really cool. The way that it fits into the hill is really nice. Uh, and after that we have a path going through the mine and... Oh, it comes out over there. I was not expecting to get two parks, but I'll take it. So this is probably Kaiserberg. Yep, there we go. And then we still have Hickory Hill, and this looks like Sakura Garden. No! Okay, okay, I, did, I didn't spoil anything. I legitimately didn't know what was coming up. But looks like we've got Pagoda Valley coming up first. Um, yeah, but you guys might probably already know that there is a scenario out there called Sakura Gardens. I guess it makes sense that these guys are both next to each other. In any case, yeah, I said it. <laughs> in any case, I have no idea what I'm going to do in the next episode. But I'd like to thank you guys for watching this one. And I hope to see you in the next one. Bye, guys.